Imagine a world where media has the power to shape our perceptions, control our thoughts, and manipulate our actions. Sound familiar? It may seem like a bleak reality in today's world, but this idea was first explored in David Cronenberg's visionary 1983 film Videodrome. Almost four decades ago, Cronenberg predicted the future of media and the dangers it could pose to society. So grab your scalpels because we're about to enter the dystopian world of Videodrome, a place where the line between fantasy and reality is blurred in this episode of Deep Cuts. The battle for the mind of North America will be fought in the video arena. The video drone. The early 1980s were a time of rapid change in technology. Home computers were now accessible to consumers. The compact disc was rapidly replacing cassettes and vinyl as the preferred way to listen to music. Many homes owned an Atari 2600 video game console. The fun is back, as you can see, with the 2600 from Atari. The VCR was revolutionizing the way we consume both television and film. It was an amazing time, and a bit of a terrifying one too. People were excited about the seemingly daily advances in technology in the first Reagan administration, but they were also concerned about it as well. You know, they got robots now making cars in the factories. That's stupid. I, I wouldn't want to be driving one of these cars put together by a robot. I don't think it's smart. I don't think it's funny. These fears ran the gamut from legitimate philosophical concerns about how tech would impact our daily life to more amorphous and theoretical fears about the impact of violent media on viewers, whether people would become addicted to television and video games, and how the government might use advances in technology in an Orwellian fashion to monitor and control its citizens. These fears, particularly the last one, captured the attention of Canadian filmmaker David Cronenberg. Cronenberg, who was already familiar with the work of philosopher and communications theorist Marshall McLuhan, took those fears and McLuhan's media studies theories and used them as the foundation for his film Videodrome. Your reality is already half video hallucination. You'll have to learn to live in a very strange new world. Without going into a beat-by-beat -beat breakdown of the film, Videodrome follows Max Wren, a television executive who becomes involved with a mysterious broadcast titled Videodrome that seems to be little more than torture as entertainment. As Max investigates the broadcast and its source, he begins to experience strange hallucinations and physical transformations that blur the line between reality and illusion. Television is a serious medium. You are the vanishing point. It goes inside you. You go on an inner trip. It is the prelude, the vestibule to LSD. The film was not a huge hit upon its release back in 1983, but has since gone on to become a sci-fi classic. Videodrome is, and it's hard, a very clever satire slash social commentary piece about the dangers of mass media. It's an eerily prescient piece of cinema that probably resonates even more now in the 21st century than it did back in 1983. Cronenberg's scathing critique of how we interact with technology and media not only nailed the zeitgeist of the 80s, but it's even more applicable now in an age of binge-watching, streaming services, VR, live streams, AI, deepfakes, and YouTube. What's interesting is that Cronenberg's film, while well, eerily accurate in painting a picture of what sort of dystopian nightmare our reliance on tech could create, seems almost quaint in the face of reality. Cronenberg and McLuhan were prophets, but it's hard to shake the feeling that both undersold the impact of tech and mass media consumption on our lives in retrospect. This is at least partially because Videodrome was made in an era where things like cell phones, the internet, artificial intelligence, and smart devices were all the stuff of science fiction. And yet, the film did manage to predict many of the technological challenges we face today. One of the film's driving themes revolves around the power of television. In the early 80s, most of rural America still didn't have access to cable TV. Satellite dishes were an option, but the majority of homes in America were still relegated to standard broadcast television, which meant a few network channels and some local programming. Videodrome runs with the idea of a future where channels compete for viewership by being more outrageous. The show Max finds on a pirated satellite feed, Videodrome, is simply men in a nondescript room torturing a woman. This lo-fi approach to entertainment is his channel's next evolution after airing softcore and what many would describe as trash TV. It must have seemed very disturbing to think of a show like Videodrome in the 1980s when scripted television was still the norm. But fast forward to today, where reality TV is a dominant force in ratings and many of us watch the real lives of people we'll never know religiously, and it doesn't seem that crazy. TV may not have given us something as disturbing as Videodrome, yet, but the internet certainly has with its proliferation of shock and gore pages, sex sites, and live streamed atrocities available for easy viewing whenever you choose to watch it. The dangers of this are summed up nicely in this review from the website Film Inquiry. It's a motif largely in service of a broader metaphor. 
The distancing effect of the screen, of media generally, is affecting our basic humanity, warping and contorting it as much as any actual physical modification might. When you see something through a screen, you partake in whatever delights or horrors it may depict from a safe vantage point, and once you've seen enough of something, you want something more. Videodrome's minor miscalculation here is simply that television would exert control over us through its presentation of selected media. Instead, we wound up with the double whammy of TV and the internet. I suspect that if he were to make Videodrome today, Cronenberg would argue the internet is the more dangerous tool. The way so much of our online experience and interaction is guided by various algorithms who almost certainly don't have our best interests at heart beyond keeping us on a platform for easy dopamine hits feels even more dangerous than televised propaganda. Beyond that, Videodrome is very concerned with the blurring of fantasy and reality as it relates to our media consumption. Companies are racing forward with AI and virtual reality as we speak, promising us metaverses we can live and work in outside of the real world. In Videodrome, Marshall McLuhan is represented in the character of Professor Brian Oblivion. Oblivion is a media philosopher who only appears on TV while on TV. It's Oblivion who proclaims that television is the retina of the mind's eye and that there is nothing real outside of our perception of reality. In what might be the most eerily prophetic of all Oblivion's observations, he states, Of course Oblivion is not the name I was born with. That's my television name. Soon all of us will have special names. It doesn't take a lot of deep philosophical thought to make the connection between that observation and the fact that we all have screen names and carefully curated identities online. Long left the new flesh. The new flesh in this day and age could be interpreted as our online personas. It could go even further with VR, allowing us to shed our physical forms in favor of a cyber existence. Think of AI, how it's recently created images of people at parties, people and parties that never actually existed. Reality becomes malleable. We believe what we see on the screen. The screen is a window into the world, the retina of the mind's eye, but the reality is often distorted in ways we never really consider by the external forces beyond the screen. That's the danger McLuhan and Cronenberg were warning us about. This all ties in with the film's not-so-subtle meditations on media manipulation and the dark side of technology. At the heart of Videodrome is the conflict between two opposing forces, Oblivion and Barry Convex. The conflict between these men represents the struggle between two opposing views on the role of technology and media in society. Oblivion is a philosopher, a media theorist, who believes in the power of television as a means of transcendence. He views television as a sort of form of virtual reality that has the potential to create a new kind of human consciousness. Convex, on the other hand, represents the military-industrial complex and the darker side of technology and media. Convex is a ruthless and cunning businessman who uses the broadcast of Videodrome for his own purposes. These include brainwashing, psychological control, and ultimately weeding out the undesirables who'd watch something like Videodrome in the first place. Why would anybody watch a scum show like Videodrome? Why did you watch it, Max? The conflict between Oblivion and Convex represents the struggle between those who believe in the potential of technology to potentially improve society and those who use it for their own selfish ends. Ultimately, this conflict raises questions about the power of media and technology to shape our thoughts, perceptions, and reality itself. We can already see the negative impacts of technology today in the form of lowered attention spans, how it impacts our relationships, the way it can shape our mental health, and how it can radicalize people to ideological causes. Cronenberg just saw the writing on the wall decades before it all came to pass. Videodrome is also a treatise on how we're manipulated by media, almost brainwashed by it and held by the whims of the people behind it. It, it makes the world a little darker because you're not perceiving reality clearly anymore, you're be it's being uh, manipulated, it's being uh, tricked. It's really propaganda. We see it all day every day in social media and internet culture. YouTube rabbit holes and weird random live streams are the 21st century's version of a pirate broadcast picked up on your satellite dish at 3 a.m. You never know what you'll find or how finding it might change you. And that is one of the big ideas behind the film, that the media we consume ultimately changes us. Whether those changes are positive or negative varies, but in the world Cronenberg's created, those changes are almost always bad. One of the best lines in the film finds Max meeting with his friend Masha. Masha has looked into the Videodrome feed and warns Max off the trail. When he wants to know why, she tells him this. It has a philosophy. And that is what makes it dangerous. Whether we consider it a philosophy or an ideology, she's correct. Videodrome has a philosophy. It explores the idea that technology is not just an external tool, but it can also penetrate and influence our bodies and minds. We see this theme represented by the transformation of Max Wren, who begins to physically and psychologically change as he becomes more immersed in the broadcast of Videodrome. As this article from Destroy the Comics explains, Wren is the perfect focal point for the strange journey Cronenberg will take us on. 
Max is our protagonist and our gateway into this film world, a small, dingy, and overcast Toronto. He represents the kind of person most susceptible to propaganda, a loner and possible sex addict with no line that he will not cross. Max is quite the anomaly in the early 1980s more than anything though because he has access to an unregulated network of highly stimulating questionable videos and he lives for it. In the present day, this is commonplace. The idea of this unholy union is further explored when Max pulls a gun from his stomach and the gun merges with him in some sort of biomechanical nightmare sequence that would have made H.R. Giger squeal with delight. The image of Max with the gun permanently attached to his hand isn't all that different than all the people we see attached to their iPhones in our daily life. And yet, as interesting as Max is, Debbie Harry's Nikki Brand is arguably more interesting still. Nikki is a radio host who forges a relationship with Max. She is portrayed as a confident and sexually adventurous woman who is drawn to the dangerous and taboo world of Videodrome. Throughout the film, Nikki becomes increasingly involved with the broadcast and its creators, ultimately leading her to become a pawn in their plans to manipulate and control the masses. As Max's investigations into Videodrome progress, Nikki becomes more and more enmeshed in its dark and dangerous world, eventually becoming a symbol of the film's central themes of technology and media's influence on the human psyche. One potential interpretation of Nikki's character is to view it as a warning of the dangers of losing oneself to the allure of technology and media, and highlights the risks these things present. Like so many of the characters in the film, Nikki serves as an auger of Cronenberg and McLuhan's concerns. While on a talk show with Max in Oblivion, she offers this observation. Well, I think we live in overstimulated times. Nikki is saying this in 1983, an era where 500 TV channel cable, YouTube, Twitch, and the endless options of the internet don't yet exist. In today's world, experts estimate that the average person is now subjected to 4,000 to 10,000 ads per day. YouTube has over 500 hours of content uploaded every minute. Social media dictates that we know what everyone thinks about everything at any given moment. The human animal wasn't built for this kind of constant bombardment of stimulation. It seems likely that these numbers will only increase as we move into the next stages of technological evolution. Or, as McLuhan puts it, one of the effects of living with electric information is that we live habitually in a state of information overload. There's always more than you can cope with. What's insidious about this is how easily we've been manipulated into living in a version of Videodrome's dystopian future. The selling point of the internet and social media remains being connected in ways we couldn't be connected prior to this technological revolution. And yet, the reality is we're more disconnected than ever. We treat the reality of physical experiences and interactions with reality filtered through screens. Take, for example, Bianca Oblivion's statement that her father's preferred method of discourse is the monologue. Professor Oblivion has basically made Timothy Leary's credo, tune in, turn on, drop out, manifest as he's already dead and only speaks through a series of pre-recorded messages on video cassettes. That Leary says McLuhan gave him that phrase only makes it that much more fitting. But, as a Paste article points out, Oblivion's preferred method of discourse, quote, immediately brings to mind the status updates or the dead-end arguments we engage with on social media. The concept of monologue as discourse is a contradiction in terms, but it also aptly describes the way we mostly communicate. Even comment sections with heated discussions serve as a series of monologues instead of a naturally occurring conversation. The extended time between responses and the lack of a personal connection creates a new mode of human communication and interaction, one that drives us further away from the intimacy we crave as social animals. In the end, I haven't really even begun to scratch the surface of what makes Videodrome so compelling and prophetic. Hell, I'm not even entirely sure I got it right in the first place. Cronenberg's Techno Nightmare is a complex film open to a wide variety of interpretations and nearly all of them feel valid on some level. What I am sure of is that through Videodrome, Cronenberg created a disturbing parable filled with unsettling imagery and philosophical observations that challenge our perceptions of reality and forces us to question the impact of technology on our lives. As technology advances at a pace that's best described as breakneck in the 21st century, Videodrome feels more timely than ever. Humans spend their days attached to technology. We are bombarded with ads and information. Algorithms manipulate what we see, read, hear, and often who we interact with. In fact, an algorithm probably led you to this video. Old media feels no more trustworthy than the tech bros curating our virtual existences. Or, as this VHS Revival article so succinctly sums it up, rather than embrace a future in which automation makes our lives easier and more satisfying, Cronenberg presents it as yet another outlet for human corruption. Not only does Videodrome challenge our dependency on technology, it predicts our fetishization of mind-numbing devices and the insidious nature fundamental to all modern technology. 
Despite its production almost four decades ago, Videodrome's relevance and impact on contemporary media, such as films, television programs, and video games, cannot be understated. The central themes of technology and its influence on society continue to captivate audiences and encourage critical analysis. As a cautionary tale, the film serves as a reminder of the importance of being vigilant and discerning when it comes to media consumption and its effects on the individual and society as a whole. In the current age of rapidly advancing technology, the message of Videodrome remains poignant and relevant highlighting the need for continued reflection and engagement with the media that shapes our beliefs, values, and perspectives. Or as Marshall McLuhan once said, In this electronic age, we see ourselves being translated more and more into the form of information, moving toward the technological extension of consciousness. Long live the new flesh indeed.